But yeah, thanks for coming back on. Uh, no, my pleasure, guys. It's really that, my pleasure. That, that, guys... that storm was unbelievable. Yeah. <laughs> I felt like you we guys were in do, You guys do such an amazing job. It's it's uh it's a pleasure to be back on with you. Thank so you yeah, la- last time we were on, Jeff, we were talking about obviously like uh, the time before last, we'll say, um, we were it was pre-draft, and we were talking about uh, everything that could be with the Jets and a few other picks. Mm-hmm. Um, well, how how do you feel that the draft went uh, for the Jets? I mean, there were, there well, was a, couple of, a couple of interesting things on day one. You know, the thing you got to to me, I think you got to always kind of pump the brakes a little bit when you start talking about the draft right after the draft. We haven't seen these guys play yet. We started to see what we think we're going to see through mini camp. You know, you've seen um, whether it's Zach at quarterback or Tucker at, you know, at guard, we, we, we're starting to see what we think those guys will be. Now that's one stage in their testing, but when they get to regular training camp and then they start playing games, we'll really, We'll get a better feel. But I think right now, if you're the Jets, you have to feel really, really good about what you've done to improve your football team. I'm not just talking about through the draft. I'm talking about in every phase what uh, what they've been able to do. And Joe Douglas, I think, deserves a tremendous amount of credit for this offseason because, you know, obviously they had draft picks. And when they traded Sam, they had, you know, spot, and they, you know, there are a lot of things that went his way, but you still got to be able to, you still got to be able to make the calls. You got to, you know, you got to get Moses at tackle late. Like they've got him for a really, I think a good contract, a fair contract for a guy of his ability. You, you factor in, you know, Elia Vera Tucker at left guard, you know, next to a guy that you think is going to be your, your cornerstone at left tackle for the next 10 years of your draft or of your team, you start looking at that. And that's, you know, really, really starting to say we're staying, we're starting to change the, the complexion of the football team. When I say the complexion, I'm not talking about, you know, their skin or their color or whatever. I'm talking about the kinds of athletes that you're putting at critical positions. Yeah. You, You go out and get a playmaker like Zach Wilson, a guy that's, you know, I think in in some ways really a complete opposite of Sam Darnold, right? Um, he's a guy that functions at the at the hardest position in football with really no conscience. When I say no conscience, I, I, it's not a negative term. I'm talking about a guy that will go out and not be afraid to fail, right? Which I always felt like Sam, whether it was the way he was coached or whether it's just the na- innate his personal makeup, he always was a, just never would really cut it loose. And I think that's something that you're going to see this kid do a lot. And he's going to make some mistakes along the way. He's going to throw some picks, but he's going to make a hell of a lot of big plays for that football team. You know, and, and, you know, you, you look at Michael Carter, I mean, golly, that's like, that is a, you're talking about bringing in a legitimate, a legitimate back. And, you know, as I go through their, I go through their, their draft, you know, I just really feel like they did a great job of addressing needs um, and, and still staying within the best player available concept, which was, and they got some breaks, you know, having Carter drop to him where he dropped to him was, you know, freaking crazy to me. But, you know, you look at this football team now, and, you know, whether it's having C.J. Mosley back or, you know, you know, I just think there's so many positive signs right now for the Jets. It certainly feels that way from everything that's coming out. We've, we've all been keeping up to date, as, as we always do, and, and trying to keep on top of everything. And everything seems to be positive, whether it's Elijah Moore, whether it's the development of um, CJ Mosley coming back and playing really well. There doesn't seem to be a whole lot of negative energy anywhere around the Jets at the moment. Well, you know, you talked about Elijah Moore, and there's another case of a guy that, and I, I shouldn't have left him off my little synopsis there, but Elijah Moore now gives you a, a guy that you've got a chance to catch a five yard slant and make it an 80 yard touchdown. And, you know, guys who have that kind of 
transcendent playmaking ability. Those guys are absolutely critical when you're talking about having a young quarterback. Um, and so, you know, you look at the things that they've done, it, you know, by bringing Keenan Cole, you know, um, Tevin Coleman, you look, Vinny Curry. I mean, you're bringing good pros to your roster. You're bringing veterans to your, to your roster. You're bringing quality rookies to your roster. You've gone out and you've used your money, I think, wisely in free agency. And so, you know, you look at a guy like Jared Davis. I think Jared Davis could have – I mean, he. you might see what we all thought we were going to see in Detroit with Jared Davis. So, you know, there's a ton of guys. Sheldon Rankins. I mean, gosh, guys, you look, you look at this and you just go, damn, they did a good job of using their money. They built a – they were saying on Take Flight, the, the sort of documentary they've done about the offseason, they've said about how they've built the front seven and the depth they've managed to get at, at sort of D-line and then into the linebackers as well has been exceptional, especially with the two rookie safeties they've taken that are going to play linebacker. It looks like there's going to be depth all over the field and particularly speed at the linebacker position as well. It looks like we're actually going to be a lot quicker, which could be a very good thing based on the tight ends the Patriots brought in at, in the offseason. I think so. And I think there, there, there are a couple of things that will be evident when you look at the Jets next year. And this is not a criticism. It's just an observation. One football coach to another football coach. Um, you know, in the system that they were in defensively last year, it's very complex. It's very oh, there's a lot of checks. There are a lot of things that have to happen to get everybody on the same page before the ball snapped. I go, I go back to that game that they lost with the cover zero call with, with, you know, to the Raiders. <laughs> and, and really it wasn't the call. It's just the ex execution of the call was so bad, but it was a call that they didn't need to make at that time with that. I mean, you got a freaking you know, free agent corner out there and he bust, he busts the coverage, which he never should have. You can argue that, but again, I don't think you need to make it that tough on them sometimes. And I think with what Robert Sala is going to bring defensively and, you know, when, when you talk about coaching staff, um, you know, he's bringing in guys that understand what he wants. They want to keep it simple. They want to let them play. They want to give them a chance to, you know, uh, be athletes, use their athletic ability instead of, you know, check and counter checking and adjusting everything on the fly. And, and, and that's not to say that there's something wrong with that, but I know Jeff Ulbricht, the new coordinator, those guys are going to fly around. They're going to fly around and they're going to hit your ass, right? They are, they are going to hit you. You can tell everybody in the NFC or in the AFC East right now that the jets are going to be physical on defense. I know that for a fact, they're not going to be complex. They're going to rush four guys. They're going to play a lot of zone coverage and they are going to tattoo your ass when the ball's thrown and, or caught. And, and I think that's going to be, again, another, another step in the rebirth of this franchise. Yeah. I'm, I'm quite excited um, by, by the changes on defense. Um, I like the idea of going a bit more zonal with the likes of bless Austin uh, I'm a big Austin fan, apart from when he's in man-to-man -man, because he can't play it. So it's one of them where don't 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 play him man-to-man. -man. Put him in zone and it, it'll be it'll be fine. Um, yeah. The new guys that have came in, um, I mean, I'm excited by uh, Pinnock. Um, he was going to be outside corner, I think. Um, yeah, it's it's all looking really really positive, which is really strange for us to still be positive at this point, because normally by now something bad's happened. <laughs> um, like we, we, get three, we get three weeks after the draft and then something bad happens. Uh, where Touchwood at the minute, we're all good. Uh, Paul, do you have a question? Yeah, um, Jeff, you, you mentioned that Robert Sala bringing in the new scheme. And I just wondered if, you know, from your experience, how important is, is the player to scheme fit and have you seen players that people have thought, actually, he's not that great, and then he's found the right scheme and suddenly, bang, he's off? 
yeah, I, I mean, there there have been so many cases. I'll give you one that 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 just really is, and I think it involved the Jets, if I remember correctly. But uh, Tampa used to have a corner by the name of Donnie Abraham, who was when when Tony was there, and they were playing all that cover two. He played the flat, and he was really a good cover two corner. He got up. He want you know he got a couple Pro Bowls, and then free agency came and i think it was the jets actually it was he, he went to the jets on a big contract <laughs> yeah and two years later he's out of the game because he wasn't a scheme fit they were trying to play man to man and they didn't play cover two and all of a sudden you know he was in a system that it didn't work for him i uh namde asamoa was another defensive back that was a pro bowler for the raiders and all of a sudden, you know, Philadelphia says, well, we got to get him to our team because he's the best corner in football. And he was at what he did, which was play press man in the old Raider scheme. And then he went to Philadelphia and Jim, you know, Jim Johnson's trying to get him to play in his own blitz system. And he just couldn't do it. And he's out of football two years later. So you see it all the time. I think what's really important is that. And I think Salah will do this. I think Jeff Ulbrich will do this. Um, I think when you watch this team, you're going to see coaches who are adjusting their schematics to fit the skills of the player, right? Mm -hmm. and, and Belichick said it better than anybody when he said, you try and maximize the talent of the player and mitigate his liabilities, so if a guy can't do something, and they, there are very few who do everything extremely well, but if a guy has a problem with something, you want to be able to hide that. You want to make sure that he doesn't get asked to do that very much. And I, get, I go back to that, that cover zero call at the end of the Raider game, and you got a free agent corner standing out there. And, you know, I mean, that's just not the play you want to give that guy to make. Now, you can argue, well, he's got to be able to make it. Yeah, that's that's an argument. But the bottom line is we're not trying to make the game hard for the players. And I think that's what Salah has a real firm grasp on from his time in San Francisco. So we've talked about defense quite a bit already, um, and we've mentioned the corners quite a lot. Um, one of the sort of things that I've been um, keeping an eye on and thinking about a lot is that Salah likes to play a lot of cover one, um, which is absolutely fine, um, but it relies on having a really, really good free safety. And in theory, we have one in Marcus May. Would you be concerned that we're not locking him down long term, or do you think it's okay to play him on the tag this year? I think I, I agree with playing him on the tag, because I think while he's shown flashes of really good play, I think he's still got to – this is kind of a prove-it year for him. And, um, you know, it, it's interesting when you come into a situation, you come into a new organization, you get some grace, right? And, you know, um, you get some time to, to really evaluate some of these guys because, you know, there's going to be some guys that are on the bubble, you know, on this football team that I think, and, and this says positive things about the Jets, but, if you go over the other side of the ball and you look at a guy like Braxton Berrios, who I'm a big fan of, who can do an awful lot of stuff for you, not, you know, make the tough catches, block, be a special teams guy, return, do all that stuff. Well, Bla Braxton Berrios all of a sudden is on the bubble. Now he's going to have to, you know, he's going to have to prove it to make this football team. Well, you know, that's good if you're a Jets fan, I think, because that means you're getting better as an organization. And, you know, those are, again, as I say, some of the real positive things that I see. Better depth, better skill. Uh, I think you're going to find a much better energy around this football team. Some of that comes from Salah himself and his, you know, the coaches he's brought in. But I really, I really think, I, I, let me just say this, guys. I had a friend, uh, I have a friend who worked for the Jets in the, in the previous organization. And he really was a big fan of Joe Douglas. He said that he's a, he said, he, he described him as a ball cap wearing football watching guy. Right. 
and that he loves, loves football. Well, he's starting to put around him guys who love football. You know, and here's what's here's the danger about being the Jets. You are in the city that every player wants to play in, or most every player wants to play in. So it becomes a destination free agency place. And sometimes you get guys who want to be in that market more than they really want to be Jets or, or be on a great football team, right? Because they know it's, it can help them drive their own personal brand, yada, 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 all the stuff that's going on today. So you got to make sure when you're in a place like that, that you're doing just like Miami, you better make sure you got guys that love football. Cause you know, once you cross the Brooklyn bridge, man, there's, there's distract, there's distractions on every corner. I mean, there's more, more ways to, <laughs> to get in trouble than any place. So, you know, so again, I think that's a real, real important part of, you know, being a general manager and being an organization. Jeff. Can I jump back a, a little bit to, to the draft and to the rookies coming in that you mentioned right at the start? Two questions for you. First one is the jump from college to NFL. Just how huge is it and how much of, a, of the development needs to come to be player-driven and how much of it is coach-driven? And the second one is the later round rookies that we've picked up for me, have got special teams written all over them. And I think it's it, the Jets have really paid attention to special teams this year. And, and I, you know, how, how important would you, you know, I think it's a subject close to your heart. Yeah, well, I, let, me, let me address the first one first. I, it was interesting, guys. I just had Sebastian Vollmer on my podcast today and, and uh, Byron Chamberlain. Now, those are two guys that have probably five Super Bowls rings between them multiple Pro Bowls, all that stuff. And both of them came into the league in different cases. Sebastian was a second-round pick in New England. Byron was a seventh-round pick in Denver. But both of them said the exact same thing. You can't even begin to understand the jump that it is from college football to pro football. And I remember when I was in Kansas City in 2001, Coach Vermeil um, – the, it was, I think, two nights before the opening, the preseason game, first preseason game. He let all the veterans out of the room. And he told the rookies, he said, fellas, I'm just going to tell you, college football is a game played by boys on Saturday afternoon. And pro football is a game played by full-grown men on Sunday afternoon. And he said... <coughs> you better get your head around the fact that this is going to be faster and more violent than anything you've ever seen. Now you've been in, you've been in practice, but you haven't been in a game yet. And I remember thinking to myself, wow, coach, what a great speech. You know, like I'm, I thought he was trying to get him ready to play. Right. <laughs> I remember the first, the first play of the game, Priest Holmes is our back and, and, <laughs> they, they snapped the ball to uh, – uh, God, I'm trying to think what the kid's name was what our, was our quarterback. He had been in the Canadian Football League. Anyway, they, they snapped the ball, and he looks downfield. No, nobody open. <laughs> Priest is running a flare route out of the backfield, so he's the, he's the check down guy. And LeVar Arrington is playing linebacker for Washington at the time. And, and – uh, Quarterback takes the ball and he drops it off to, to, to Priest. And all of a sudden, this flash, this maroon flash went in my vision. And there was a collision of which I had never heard before. This is a preseason game, right? <laughs> and I thought to myself, now I understand what coach is talking about. And, and so they've got – They've got some growth that's got to come. But again, like Sebastian said, and like Byron said, the only way to get past all that is to play, is to go out and compete and play and 
find out that, yes, you do belong and you are good enough and you can make a contribution. And so a lot of that comes from the environment that's created in the organization. This is a case in point. When Byron Chamberlain went from being a big receiver to being a tight end, he went to the equipment manager. And this is a great story he told on my podcast. He said, Jeff, I went to the equipment manager as soon as Shanahan called me in and told me I was moving to tight end. And he, I asked him, would you please move my locker next to Shannon Sharp's locker? Because if he's the best there is, then I want to learn everything I can from being right next to Shannon Sharp. And I thought that was really, really indicative of a young player recognizing that he has a lot to learn. And they, the best way to learn it is to emulate the veterans that are, that are, you know, that got it figured out. Nice. I think that's something that we need from Elijah Moore and Jameson Crowder. We were talking about more before that leadership and that veteran presence, I think is something that needs to flow over into the jets. Now we need that. Yeah. And, and again, part of that whole process, right. Is putting the right guys in a position to lead, right? Because not everybody leads the same way and not everybody wants to lead. But if you've got guys that are legitimate guys and the leadership is based upon their production and the way they do their business, where they go about their business, then you got a great chance. Because let me tell you something, whether it's a coach or a, another player, the players can see through guys in two seconds. And they know if you're a bullshit guy or if you're not a bullshit guy. And like I say, they're going to look when Robert Salas stands up to talk to him. They're going to listen to everything he says, and then they're going to watch everything he does. And if what he does and what he says don't match up, they're in trouble. Right. But I know enough about Robert Salas that I 100 percent believe that what he says and what he does. I know Jeff Ulrich's, Ulrich's that way. What they say is what they do and what they'll be. And so then the players are put at ease and they know that they're, you know, that they're dealing with a guy that they can trust. And that, you know, that trust is the most important factor in, in winning, winning football games, I think. On the Jameson Crowther, but I, I was incredibly impressed with how he's carried himself since, since the, 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 he certainly re-signed the contract or, or they renegotiated the contract. Uh, the cynic in me says, yeah, that's the public persona he's presenting. Um, you know, you're talking about leadership in the, in the dressing room. Uh, is, is, how much of that public persona can we, you know, it's a business. How much do the players understand? Yeah, you know, this is just how it is. And so they do act the way that Crowder is acting or... Or is it a case of, well, I'm in public, so I'd better say the right things? How much is... Or is well, it I, think, I, the I think it's it's a mix, and it depends a little bit upon the organization that you're in and the individual that you're talking about. But usually when a guy's been in the league as long as Jamison Crowder has, he's figured it out by now. He's seen enough guys come and go. He recognizes what it's like to be at the bottom because he's had some tough past years in New York. And there's nothing... Because when, if, when a player goes through adversity, when he goes through hard times, usually they react in one of two ways. It's some of them will point the finger and say, it's not me. It's everybody else in the room. You know, everybody else is screwed up. It's not my fault. Or others will say, I need to take charge. I need to take charge of me first. And then I, I, I want to win because they all have to make a conscious decision how much they're going to, they're willing to pay, how, how high the price is that they're willing to pay. This is why when you, when you look at other teams in the division, and I'm going to say Buffalo right now, New England historically, and I think they're doing the same thing in Miami, is when, when they went into Buffalo, they went into a situation that's a lot like the Jets is right, was last year. Mm -hmm. bad personnel, selfish guys, 
bad energy, no culture, all that stuff. And they made a conscious, conscious decision between Brandon Bean and, and Sean McDermott that they were going to get rid of guys that were selfish guys. And all of a sudden you see them unloading guys that are good football players, you know, <laughs> Darius, the nose tackle is a pro bowler and they got rid of him. They got rid of him because he couldn't stay out of trouble. He couldn't stay at kid and keep his weight and all that other stuff. It doesn't take getting rid of very many of those kind of guys for the other guys, the guys that are kind of on the bubble to figure it out and go, Oh shit, they're not, they're not screwing around here. Right. And, you know, and, and usually it writes itself. And then you bring in the kind of guys that you want, right? The kind of guys that practice the way you want them to practice, who understand how important taking care of your body is, staying out of the streets, you know, all the stuff that, you know, contribute. Because, like I say, one of the hardest things to, in my mind about that place, as opposed to Buffalo, is – you know, you can get in trouble in Buffalo, but you got a heck of a lot more opportunities to get in trouble, you know, in Manhattan than you do in Buffalo. I think um, that culture shift and trying to get the right guys into practice and to be in the locker room was evident in the draft with the number of team captains that we drafted and the fact that he went after guys that had shown leadership in college and potentially had been through adversity. The, the late round pick, the safety from Florida, had, had been through adver- adversity with his knee, um, previously and will be a good player at some point. Yeah, and and, and, and again, the, the extra work that you do evaluating players, because everybody can gather information, right? Uh, he's this fast, he's this tall, he benches this much, but it's when you put the tape on, how do they play? You know, like, and, and again, I don't want to, I don't want to build the expectation of Zach Wilson out of the building, but you know, I watched him play the first game last year and he went to Navy and Navy while not being a very talented team comparatively is always a very, very disciplined, tough, make everything, make you work for everything. And let me tell you something, Zach Wilson went out and he just slaughtered him. And I went, wow, that kid is different. And then I watched him do it against other people on the schedule at BYU who had better players, who had better athletes. And I thought to myself, that kid's got that stuff, that magical stuff. Now, again, he's going to have, he's going to have some bad days. He's going to have some long afternoons. I mean, you're in the, you're in a division with Belichick, who's, you know, famous for making young quarterbacks lives miserable. You're going to got a great defense in Buffalo. You got a great defense in Miami. This this division, man, you guys, you talk about in the last three years, this division has exploded with players and with good football teams used to be the AFC East was New England and everybody else behind them. Now, I'm going to tell you something. It is wide asshole. Speaking about um, culture, uh, Dan Feeney, go. (laughs) (laughs) How 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 important is a Dan Feeney in the dressing room? The rest of the, play, the team pulling everybody oh. together and just having a blast. I think I think you can't underestimate it. I, I really I really really believe it's guys. I'm telling you, I've done it for a long time. Been through a lot of seasons. When you're talking about a 17 game schedule, uh, you're talking about a long. It is a marathon. It's not a sprint. It's a marathon. And one of the things that I say to our kids every year is, guys, I can only guarantee you one thing. And that's that you're going to face adversity as a professional football player. And I can't guarantee you how many games we're going to win, you know, any of that stuff. But I do know this. This football team is going to face adversity time and time again through the year. And how we handle it and how we individually and collectively deal with adversity is going to say a lot about how far we're going to go as a football team. And, you know, I I just really think that when you get around guys who understand that, and I'm talking about coaches, and, you know, when when you look at a coaching staff and you realize that, 
you know, there are no bad coaches in, in, in the National Football League, but there are some that have that ability to reach into a player deeper than other guys can. And when I listened to what really made me stand up and take notice about Robert Sala was the first year he was in San Francisco, they were trying to run his ass out of there. The, the San Francisco 49er fans, they, they didn't have enough players. They, you know, he, he was coaching a team. He was coaching a group that was deficient, but he never let that affect him. He never let that affect his, the way he handled himself, the way he handled the team, all those things. He was consistent through all the hard times. And that's, I think, what bought him the credibility with his guys that all of a sudden now, two years later, they're more talented, but the approach has remained the same. And the older guys can look to the younger ones and say, hey, listen, man, there was a time around here where his ass was getting ripped in the paper every week. And he never blamed us. He always took it himself. He always, that's leadership. And that's what I, that's what I saw out of him. And that's what I think we're going to see out of him as a head coach in New York. Interesting to me will be to watch because New York is, they talk about Philly being a tough town. New York from a media standpoint to me is the toughest town because there's so many papers and everybody's trying to find, you know, that little story. And so, and usually the story they're trying to find is not a positive one. It's a negative one. And so he's going to have to deal with that, but I think he's hardened to that from his time in San Francisco. Yeah. I mean, I think we've, uh, we've noticed that over the, the last couple of weeks with the Mackay Becton uh, uh-huh. stories coming out. I mean, Coach Salah kind of put put the quash on it when he uh, when he was asked about it, and he went, "It's not a weight problem. That is a massive human being, uh, and he needs to get to the weight that he's comfortable at, and we're comfortable when he's comfortable." But the papers are making out that he's like grossly overweight and he can't move, uh, which we've seen him in practice. Yes, he's 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 got an injury, which they've put down to. Um, bad body management, we'll say. But, I mean, it, that's got to be a massive change. Like, the amount of calories that Becton must be taking just to be able to physically compete at that level must be insane. Well, you know, I, I'm going to say this. I The only question I had about Makai Becton when I watched him on tape was that very issue, right? You could see, now he was raw at Louisville. I mean, raw. But you saw some athletic gifts for a man that was 350 or whatever. I mean, I, who knows what he weighed because I don't think you could weigh him on a normal scale. But, you know, for how big he was to, to move like he could move and the things that he could do with his body, the way he could bend and supple, how supple he was and all that. But you always worry about a guy who has weight issues. Now, this is my own personal thing, so I'm going to tell you. I'm just telling you that. off. The, I don't like fat guys. But the, the, the thing that – because here's the reason. Usually, if, if they're guys, that's not going to improve when you put a million dollars in their pocket, right? And you don't have the ability to look after them every day, right? So – what I'm hopeful for Makai is that he takes this lesson and learns that the only thing that's keeping him from being, and, I, and I'm going to say that it's, with, as long as he has everything, he gets all the luck and doesn't have injuries and all that other stuff. The only thing that's keeping him from being a Hall of Fame player is just time and himself, yeah. right? And so what's really important, I like the psychology behind the way that Sala handled it. When Jerry Glanville, who's a good friend of mine, had a big offensive tackle named Lincoln Kennedy in Atlanta, he was asked that Kennedy went through this back the very same thing. And so the media in Atlanta asked Jerry, what do you think about your overweight left tackle coach? 
And Jerry said, you know what? There's only two words that are keeping that kid, Lincoln Kennedy, from being a Hall of Fame player. And the media, media goes, what's that, coach? And they, he said, I'm full. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> like, so that's how Jerry handled it. He made a joke of it, right? Yeah. But that alienated Lincoln. He thought he was making fun of him. And yeah. so I think what mm. Sal has done is kind of take the kid like this and let him know in no uncertain terms that he's got to watch his weight. He's got to be a pro. He's got to be proactive about all this without making him feel like he's a fat turd. Yeah, well, I think that's what kind of happened because Makai then came out and he's hired a personal chef uh, because what his issues were is, like what I said, he was struggling to take the right calories. He was like, I need to have like, I don't know, like 10,000 a day. But he was just eating 10,000 calories. They weren't necessarily the calories he needed. <laughs> so, well, you know what? You go back to, like I said, you go back to, the, go back to the draft. And I, I don't know if you guys knew this, but my Kai's mother is a, like, she's a soul food chef, right? And so she, this kid's been eating good for a <laughs> it it yeah. stumps me that uh, uh, an establishment like the NFL, with all the science and all the knowledge that they they have, don't have uh, nutritionists just you know at, at their fingertips to to take these players and say, right, what are you eating? Or, or do they? I'm, they just a, I'm, know about I'm telling you, I know for a fact that they do, right? <laughs> at that facility, and I mean, I've been to the, I've been to that facility, and and it is the Johnson and Johnson. It is unbelievable. It is state of the art everything, and they they do have a what we used to call a fat man's table, which is where the the guys with weight issues go and get separate food so and counseling. Like and all that. But the reality of it is you can't, you, you, when they leave this facility at five o'clock in the afternoon, right. Or whenever they leave, then they're on their own. And that's when it's tough. So you got a young kid who has, who, who has a problem managing his, his diet. Mm. And he's got a million dollars in his pocket. And you're in New York City, where some of the best food in America is, right? That's not a good combination. And so the same thing's true on the other side. Like, I can't tell you guys how many times I would see athletes come in. I'm talking about pro athletes, right? Guys that their body is their business. They would roll up to the facility at 6.30 in the morning with a McDonald's bag, right? And egg McMuffins and grease dripping out of the bottom of the bag and the whole thing. And here are guys that should know better, probably do know better, but because there's nobody to kind of manage them, they can't manage themselves. And they sometimes, some of them eat or drink or, you know, drug or sex their way out of the game. I think that's something that, as you touched on before, um, Salah will, will gain their respect and very quickly they'll know that that's not going to be an acceptable line in New York anymore. And I think Joe as well is, is someone that's going to sort of set that line. And I think that will help Makai as well. Having a coach that he probably respects more than potentially Gase um, and with Douglas as well, I think that will really help. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think that'll be one of the big projects for their offensive line coach is to create some sort of relationship you know, it's interesting, guys, and, and, and uh, it sounds like I'm pushing my podcast. I'm not. I'm just telling you the, <laughs> when, I, when, we, when we had Sebastian on today to hear him talk about Dante Scarnecchia, who's the legendary offensive line coach in New England, to yep. hear him talk about how tough Scar was on him and how he pushed him and, and really, really, really never gave him an inch, right? Sebastian always knew that he was doing it because he cared about him. See, mm -hmm. I think, I think players 
once players know that you really genuinely care about them, they'll, they'll take an awful lot of hard coaching. They'll take an awful lot of demands. And I, I'm hopeful for Makai Becton that he can create that kind of relationship with his offensive line coach. So on the on the offensive side of the ball, obviously we've uh, we've brought in Mike Lafleur, and everybody seems to kind of go, oh well, he's from the Shanahan tree. That's what we should expect. Um, but then obviously his brothers over at Green Bay. Do you reckon we're going to see a hybrid or something totally different? Because uh, I think everybody was really guilty of nobody really looked into him till we got him, mm-hmm. and then it was you only kind of look at the good, not necessarily the bad. Because we have to look at the good, or we end up in that turmoil of being Jets fans again. (laughs) (laughs) Obviously, I I think your coaching background should give us an insight a little bit. I think. Yeah, I think I think Lafleur will be his own man. Obviously, he's been around his brother. He's been around um, Sean McVay. He's been around really good football coaches, really good offensive football coaches. I think you'll see a hybrid system that's somewhere between what Green Bay does and what San Francisco does. And I think what we'll see the first year in particular is as much as possible things that Zach is comfortable with, things that he can do as a rookie. People don't understand the importance of time with a quarterback and an offensive coordinator. I'm talking about the time where they really get to know one another and get to know the things that each other likes, right? When it's, when it functions at the highest level, in my experience, the quarterback and the offensive coordinator really spend an awful lot of time together, just one-on-one about, okay, it's third and three. What do you like? What, what, what do you feel good about? What are the things you, you – because every quarterback's going to str- struggle. And the key, in my mind, for a signal caller or, or a coordinator to help a struggling young quarterback is to put him in situations where he's comfortable, things that he's, he likes to do, maybe things that he did in college that he's, that he's f- more familiar with. I, I heard one – offensive quarters coordinator say this to me and I it was really I thought really interesting is he does an inventory of all the calls during the week and let's say they run uh, a smash concept which is a hitch in a corner route and that's the number one concept they ran all week they ran it more than anything else he makes a note on his call sheet for the plays that they've run and repped the most in practice during the week, because if they get stuck or they, they get off schedule or they're looking for a call, he always wants to go back to something that the quarterback has done an awful lot of don't with a rookie, just reach out there and grab one off the left. She, you know, it's like going to a Chinese restaurant, right? Where you get one from column a one from column B one from column C, but there's, column F over there and you want one of those too. And all of a sudden you reach over and grab it and you know, it's sea urchin or something, something you don't really, you know? And so that's what I'm saying about, it's really important for a caller to get to know his guy. And the only way to get to know his guy is through time and practice and preseason games. And that's, again, I think where this is a good year for a young quarterback to come into the game because he's going to have all that again. Last year, I, I, what Herbert did is beyond belief to me, really. So a question based around that, I guess, and um, partly looking backwards, partly looking forwards, I suppose. Um, Sam failed um, with ourselves to sort of develop into what we thought he was going to develop into. Um, you've just mentioned the fact that Zach's going to have a lot of time with an OC. Sam didn't really have that because the OC was essentially – the head coach and he had to deal with the whole team and the actual offensive coordinator really was just a figurehead for the head coach in this system uh, with Salah obviously being the head coach and having a dedicated offensive coordinator. Do you think that's going to help Zach as opposed to where Sam had a head coach that was really an offensive coordinator? Yeah, I think so. I I, I really do. Um, Now 
you know, I, I think that from his first press conference forward, Adam had it all stacked against him in New York. Um, I mean, I, I would think if you probably talk to him and ask him if he had to do it over again, would he have maybe sat out for a year and then taken another job as opposed to jump right into the same division with a, with a team that was struggling. Um, but, you know, again, that that's, you know, in the past. And I think for, for Zach, I think for his development, it's really, really important that those two are tied at the hip and that they really have a good rapport. So you mentioned earlier on about uh, obviously bringing in Moses uh, for the right side. Um, obviously, we had George Fant last year in right tackle. Mm -hmm. uh, Fant did play guard over in Seattle. Do you see him moving inside and maybe um, Lewis uh, Og Van Roten taking a back seat? Or do you see Fant playing more of a swing role? Well, I think it's going to be interesting to see how that sorts out. You know, Van Roten played up in our league, played in the CFL. And I was, you know, he was a good player in the CFL. I didn't think he was a great player. I didn't think he was big enough. Um, but he has done well in the NFL. He's done better than I thought he would have done in the NFL. But I, I think, you know, you look at that front and you feel good about where you are on the left side. And again, having Moses and Fant does give you some, flexibility if plant if Fant wants if they want to drop down and be bigger inside with Fant at guard and Moses at tackle you've got the ability to do that if Van Roten can fight him off then Fant can be a swing tackle and you know you got some depth because again guys in a 17 week schedule you're going to get injuries and you're going to need depth and I think that's you know when you look at that that's really a positive that you know they've been able to go out and get Moses at this late date is it possible that they've gone and got Moses to give Fant another year to develop at tackle? Could be. Could be because really Moses is on a one-year prove a deal, right? Yeah. And it was it was smart, in my opinion, for the Jets to do that. Because if he comes in and he likes, they like him and he's what they want. He's already in-house, and it's easier to keep a guy in-house than it is to go out and get one. So I think it was a wise move. And like you say, it may be to give Fant some breathing air and, and let him, let him develop. No, I like, I like that idea. <laughs> you mentioned putting the rookie quarterback in um, sort of favorable situations. We've talked about beefing up the O-line, improving the O-line. That's going to have a knock on effect, hopefully to Michael Carter, as we discussed earlier, uh, P Ryan, Tevin Coleman. Do you think the Jets are in a good position to, to run the ball sort of 25, 30 times a game now? I think the Jets are going to want to run the ball 25 or 30 times a game. I think that's, you know, typically when you have a defensive head coach like Sala is, the recipe for success is run the football, control the clock, play great special teams, which we talked about. They've, they've gone out and in their draft really tried to improve their special team bodies um, and shorten the game that way. Very few times when you see a defensive head coach do you see a team go out there and throw it 60, 60 times a game because defensive coaches don't much care for that. So I think they know that Zach is their bread and butter. He's their guy. And so they'll do the things that give him a chance to succeed. A lot of that will be, I think, very similar to what we saw with Jimmy Garoppolo in San Francisco. It's play action, half field reads, boots, nakeds, you know, uh, things where he's on the run. Because one of the things I liked about Zach Wilson when I evaluated on tape was he didn't need the perfect foot platform to throw the ball. He can throw the ball off of any foot, foot platform. He can throw the ball on the run. He can throw the ball when he's going to his left. He can, you know, they're, they're really, he may be better when he's on the move and, you know, running around than he is in the pocket. Although, you know, I've seen him make a lot of great throws from the pocket too. It's, it's great. It's just brilliant having someone like yourself and the, the information and the stuff that you bring to us is fantastic. I, 
Is, is there a, do you find that the, the, the British fans which, you know, are more positive? Because we, when we look at the, some of the websites and you see some of the, you know, oh, Joe Douglas has done this, sack him now, he's rubbish. And over here we go, oh yeah, that's a sensible move. And, you know, is, there a, <laughs> is there a difference between us? Well, you gotta you gotta get away from ground zero because when you're in northern New Jersey, it's pretty tough. <laughs> but you know, you guys have the advantage of being across the pond, and you can see it from a little bit better vision. I think sometimes, I, you know, fans, you know, and I'm the same way because I'm a fan at heart. You know, and and uh, you know, every time the Raiders make a move, I go, oh my god, you know, like it, because I've suffered a lot of years too, like you guys have. So. Uh, but I think that's kind of the fun of it too, you know, is that we get to really get attached to our teams and get, a, get attached to uh, when you root for a team like the Raiders or the Jets or the Lions, which are the, those are kind of my teams, you know, it's almost a, a, it's a, it's a weird obsession because you know, <laughs> you know, you're going to get pounded, but you still love them anyway, you know? And that's why I'm really happy. I, I'm excited for the Jets. I really am excited for the organization. I'm excited for the players that have been there. I'm excited for a fan base because I really think that they are going to be better. And I don't know how many wins better because you're going to you're in a really tough division. But I think certainly they are going to be way way better. And not the days of the Jets being a laughing stock. I think are over. Yeah. That's, that's always, always music to our ears. <laughs> yeah. I think Joe Douglas has really seen a lot of that because I mean, Morgan Moses was a perfect example. We didn't hear that Morgan Moses was going to be visiting with the Jets. We heard that he had visited with the Jets. You know, we, we, okay, Zach Wilson was a, a, a badly kept secret. It's the only badly kept secret we've had in two years. Yeah, and I know what you know what what tells me an awful lot too about a guy is how does he respond when everything's going to shit around him, right? Which is what happened last year in New York. Mm -hmm. And you know, he could have very easily, very, very easily said, you know, it's it's you know, the coach's fault. He wasn't my guy. He was here before I got here. We're going to get rid of, you know, he could have put it all on the head coach and he didn't. And he handled it. I thought with real class and see to me, if I'm a, if I'm a free agent or if I'm a coach looking at that program or whatever, I really want to see what the boss said when people weren't being kind to him, when they, you know, when they tell him, Hey, you got a you got an awful football team. Your head coach is, you know, is stupid or whatever. He 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 handled himself, I thought, extremely well in that situation. So, obviously, uh, going on to this year, just before of it, well, it was what just before our last call, uh, we found out that uh, we're coming to London. Which um, I mean, I actually I, I met you, Jeff, uh, in a hotel in London uh, on the way to a Twickenham game. Is that right? This and I was so story. hungover, I was like literally running down the stairs. Um, <laughs> and we're, like, we, yeah, it was it was it was a bad one. Uh, um, <laughs> it was uh, the Arizona game, um, but yeah. Uh, I've got like we've all got fond memories of the London games. Uh, obviously, we know you're a big part of the London games uh, with your work with Sky. Uh, what are your thoughts about the two games this year, and obviously our Week Six game? Well, I think I think the the games in London to me, and I've said this a bunch of times, and I really I really believe it. Next to the Super Bowl. The London games are the best game day experience you can have as an NFL fan. And the reason I say that is you guys know because you've been to a number of them. When you go to a game, even if your Jets aren't playing, you're going to wear your Jets top. 
and you're going to be a Jets fan watching an NFL game. That's like the Super Bowl. That's what the Super Bowl is like to me. Because when you go to the Super Bowl, shoot, guys, there's 32 teams jerseys all over the place and everybody's excited and you know and that's the same environment you get in Wembley now anytime your team comes that's even a bigger deal and when your team comes with a guy that could be the savior of the franchise as a, as a young quarterback a brand new head coach a new coaching staff you know all these additions that we've talked about if you're a Jets fan I mean I'm taking the week off work. I'm not taking the day off work. I'm taking the week off work, and I'm going to be out at those practices every day. It's exactly what I've done. <laughs> <And me. laughs> um, we were on with uh, Nick uh, Mangold the other night, and we were talking about the London game. Uh, and we know you, you've you had a little bit of uh, backwards and forwards on Twitter with him. Uh, he's desperate to come over. We need we need to set this up. We'll, we'll have a barbecue party. Nick will cook. You can come along. It'll be a It'd be great. Hey, I'm telling you, I'm in. And if Nick Mangold's there, you better you better order a lot of food. I know that. <laughs> <laughs> and, and somebody better get a napkin so he can get the barbecue sauce out of his beard after he eats too. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Well, um, we are working with Nick with his with his barbecue sauce as well. Ah, uh, that's awesome. So, you so know his what? Sauce Give is going to be in the UK. Send me his stuff, and I'm going to get him on our show, and and we'll uh, we'll we'll promote him to come over for the game. I'd love to have him. He's great. He's a great dude. Yeah, awesome. Well, we'll, we'll definitely do that. Um, so, the London game, obviously, you mentioned that, the atmosphere and everything. Um, do you know anything about the Spurs stadium for this year? Because, obviously, the last time we played at Spurs, there was no tailgate because of building works. Do you know if that will change this year? I would anticipate – I would really anticipate that it is going to change because – I know that the NFL knows that that tailgate experience is such a big part of the game. It's such a big part of any NFL game, but it's really become a big part of the London games. And I remember the first one I went to at Wembley and Neil and I are up doing a little thing on stage. And I looked out and there must have been 20,000 people underneath us. And I thought back to the day in Spurs Stadium in 1995 when we came in to play the London Monarchs, and I think you could have counted every fan on on your two hands. I swear to God, That's, it it is growing so so much. I mean, um, <clears throat> we're we're trying to talk to as many people as we can to kind of to grow it over here, both for the Jets and the NFL, um, and then obviously the excitement um, we. We work with a lot of the guys in Europe as well. We chat with them. Uh, we had Gangrene Germany on um, with Nick. And obviously, they've announced that they've got a game starting next year. Like, how big is that going to be for Germany? Because obviously, you, you were big in NFL Europe um, mm -hmm. and obviously in Germany. Um, but it, I think it was, what, the early 2000s? Yeah. I, I, I tell you what, it was, it was interesting, man. Sebastian told us today that um, he's involved in that process. And the way they're going to do it, Brent Gosper told us on Inside the Huddle last week that the, that the plan is to have the cities inside of Germany. So you got to believe that Cologne, Dusseldorf, Frankfurt, Berlin, Hamburg, those teams of all, those cities have all had NFL Europe teams. Munich has a beautiful stadium. It's a great city. There's going to be at least that many cities will be bidding for the right to host an NFL game. What the NFL does so much better than any other sports league is they create interest and they create competitive interest between cities, which they drive to build hype around the games. And Sebastian told me that that process has already begun. And it's going to be fascinating to watch and see which city in Germany actually gets the first game. I think there'll be multiple games in Germany before long. And we'll have multiple games in England, too. Yeah, I can see it only getting bigger now. Um, because, yeah, I feel like everybody's kind of noticing now. Where A few years ago, everyone's like, oh, yeah, it's getting bigger. Where now I think it's got to that point where it's, 
oh, we have to take notice. But I, I'm on the side of the fence where I don't really want a London franchise because I'm yep. still gonna I'm still gonna be a Jets fan. Yeah. <laughs> I've, I've endured for over twenty years. I can't swap now. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think this is probably the best way. And I mean, I know Gangrene Germany they've booked out a whole hotel for the Jets game in London. Um, so yeah, it's 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 already really really big. Um, we were talking to a couple of guys from from the Jets, and they were saying that uh, the European sales in like jerseys and merch, the Jets are actually number one in sales. Well, which, you know, uh, here's here's the thing that here's the thing that Brent talked talked to us about was that what's really interesting that the NFL has done now is they've given the franchises the right to have what they call secondary territories where, for example, let's say the Jets wanted to activate Birmingham or whatever as their secondary market, then they have the right to, to encourage teams to put a game there to, you know, to market in this, in that, in that um, area. Uh, I, I just really think that's huge. And you think about it now as these owners you know, we've got a number of owners now who have at least part ownership in premiership teams. It really makes sense for them to get involved this way. So, you know, what Woody Johnson does with it is going to really be interesting to see. Yeah, I'm excited to see where they go. Obviously, with all, all of the the Jets media team this year have been on point. Um, I've always felt that we've always been a little bit behind. But this year, they've just seemed to have knocked it out of the park. Um, like, Flight was brilliant. All the hype leading up to that, just the coverage, the photos, that behind look that they've brought us in to pretty much every decision. Uh, I'm excited to see what they do for London. I keep uh, I keep probing the people that I'm talking to. It'll be like, is there anything happening? Uh, do you need an extra? <laughs> um, but then if it gets down to the point, Jeff, we're just going to have to come on to Sky Sports with you. Uh, hey. <laughs> Bring it on, baby. Bring it on. I was just wondering with the London uh, franchise possibility, how, how the people of Jacksonville feel about a London team playing in their city. You know, I, I don't know. It's going to be interesting. I, I, I still think that uh, that that is yet to yet to be determined. I think that I think the COVID thing probably hit the, you know, it, it probably made the timing a little bit different now than you know because again we've, we've taken about a year and a half off you know in terms of building you know the the franchise and building emphasis towards the franchise and all that stuff so i, I think it's going to i think we're going to have a little bit of a pause here and see where we're going and i think covid's taught us an awful lot of things and not just about health but about marketing and you know all of that kind of stuff so be interesting to see how it adjusts. No, absolutely. Um, I mean, to think about it, a year and a half ago, I wonder how many Zoom chats you were doing, Jeff. I mean, <laughs> Very I, many. I tell you what, I didn't know what Zoom was, and now I <laughs> now I'm now I'm a major in it. But <laughs> it's about you know we start our training camp in 14, 15 days, and um, we're going to be inside the same protocols that the NFL was last year. All, you know, your mask, social distancing, uh, in the weight room, you know, no, can't eat in the cafeteria six, you know, I mean, meetings all done by virtual meetings, all of that stuff. So I'm, I'm going to be interested to see how it affects the day-to-day -day operations of a football team. And that, that's with Hamilton. Yeah. 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 So are you excited to go back? Well, I, you know, I love to coach. I love football. And, you know, so I'm, I'm a, I'm a football junkie and, and uh, it's, it's, uh, you know, I, I work at a really good place, a really good organization, a really great guy to work for, um, got great players. Um, so for me, it's, it's a, it's a real plus. One of our kids, actually, you guys probably remember him uh, was, I think a, third round pick of the of the Jets uh out of Louisville a kid named Lorenzo Malden and uh yeah. 
yeah. Lorenzo's the lament Lorenzo's a tremendous, tremendous kid and a tremendous story. He was, you know, he basically on the street as a young kid, you know, both parents incarcerated, went for I think he was in like six foster homes by the time he was twelve. Just a really, really tough life. And ended up graduating from Louisville and played with the Jets and now is up finishing his career with us and just a great kid. We'll need to get him on next time. Get him on with you. We'll you guys, you know, if you guys want, if you guys want me to arrange that, I'll, I'll get a hold of him. You know, his yeah, story cool. is his story is phenomenal. It's oh, yeah. absolutely phenomenal. So, how how are you fixing for the league this year? How how are Hamilton going to do? Because uh, I think we're we should be good, but you know, right now because of COVID, you, you know, everybody's had a year and a half off, right? We haven't played. The last time we played was the championship game in 2019 we haven't played so you know again we've got a veteran team now how that affects us we don't know because you know we've got guys that have had a year and a half off football and now how are they going to come back are they going to be in shape or you know all that stuff so I think it's going to be really interesting to see um obviously when you're out of the market for a year and a half the, the, the fans are dying to get football back and that'll be fun to, to go out on the field again in front of the fans and give the fans what they want is, is going to be a, a lot of fun. If they've been out of it for a year and a half, Jeff, I suggest you double the fat guy's table. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we ought to double, we ought to double the amount of wood that's on the, on the benches on the fat guy's table. <laughs> No, it's, it's going to be good to see. I mean, um, we're just excited to get any type of uh, sport and uh, ball back. I mean, Brit Ball started today. So yeah. the British American football. Uh, we had a little bit of a chat before you joined us on that. Um, my, my local team won their first game. Ever. There you go. There you go. Um, so, yeah, it's not too bad. You know what? I, I really think it's in, it, 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 to me, if I'm a football fan, and, you know, my dad, my dad, I, I remember him saying this all the time. And he was a really successful high school coach and then finally got a chance to coach in the pros at the end of his career. But he used to say all the time, you know, big time is where you're at. And I think, you know, if I'm a football fan, I'm going to go watch, you know, the Ken Exiles or I'm going to go watch the London Blitz or I'm going to go watch the Ipswich Cardinals or, you know, whatever team, you know, whatever teams in my local area because I want to watch football again, football is yeah. football. Right. And so get out and go see those young kids, go see the kids, the Brit ball kids. I think that's, I think that's a real great message to send forward. Well, once, once you're back over in the UK, we'll, we'll get you out of the London teams. <laughs> All right. and go and see somebody with a smaller catchment area <laughs> where every, everybody plays all three phases. <laughs> all right. Some teams don't have kickers, but yeah. Um, you know what? When I was, when I was working for the National Football League in player development, international player development, um, I, I truly love that. I love to go to practice and watch the players and talk to the coaches and go to the games. And, and I remember the first time I saw Sebastian Vollmer play as a junior in Dusseldorf, right? And he didn't know. I mean, you talk about raw. I mean, he was, he had no idea what was going on around him, but he, here was this great big kid that was about seven inches taller than every other kid on the field and was so gifted. And then to think that that kid would go on and be a second round draft choice and have two Super Bowl rings and play in three of them. And it is just a phenomenal, phenomenal deal. And who's to say that the next one's not out there playing in some windswept soaked field in, in England someplace. Oh, he, he's hoping. He's hoping. I, um, I, I studied um, at Staffordshire University and one of the lads that played for our university ended up with the New Orleans Saints. Um, and I cannot remember his name now. He was a running back and he ended up with the Saints on their practice squad for the year they won the Super Bowl. That's awesome. Yeah, that that's awesome. really cool. Are you, are you surprised that there aren't more crossovers from rugby? Or is it just too completely different? I, I don't think it's completely different. I think that, um, as a matter of fact, 
I thought about this the other day. I was watching the English team play, and um, never mind. <laughs> no, 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 I'm de- I'm serious. I, I, the game rugby has gotten closer to football, and football's grown closer to rugby. You're starting to see more things borrowed from each sport, right? Like I watch the players now, and the physicalness of the players in rugby now is to me completely different than it was 15, 20 years ago when I first came over the, the way that they communicate on the sidelines, the fact they've got a a phone now to a guy upstairs, all those things are things that they got from American football and you watch American football and you see more and more rugby esque ideas on how to advance the ball. You know, somebody is going to get ahead of the curve. And they're going to teach guys to lateral and you'll start to see multiple laterals on, on plays in pro football. Now I know for us, we do it all the time because the rules are very much closer to rugby in Canadian football. You can punt the ball. And if you're behind the ball, you can go catch it and advance it. Right. That's called an onside kick. So we do all of those things now. And, every year we score touchdowns and people stand around and look at and go, what? But it's just plays we've bought, we borrowed from rugby. Like Coaches that. are magpies. They steal from everything. Yep. That we are. We steal everything. Nobody thought there's not an original thought out there. It's the truth. <laughs> Andy, you had your hand up previously. Did you have a question? Yeah. I was just about to say to Jeff, we'd love to see you at the London game. I think you've got a game on the Monday. So you won't be, will you not be over? I don't, I don't know what, uh, I'm still in the process right now of deciding with Sky what my, uh, what my availability is going to be. Okay. Um, I was just a quick question for you. If you were on the Jets coaching staff at the moment, would you be concerned uh, about your quarterbacks not playing, none of them playing a snap in the NFL currently? Well, I think, uh, I wouldn't be worried about it because it's the way it is, but I would be concerned that we do everything we possibly can to get them as ready as they can be for their first game. So every chance that Zach gets to compete in a seven on seven or a team period or what he needs to compete with consequences, right? So that, you know, it's not just, okay, there's no, there's no winner. No, there needs to be a clear cut winner and loser in everything that he does. So he can see what it, what, you know, better understand anyway, what it takes to win in the national football league. One of the things it takes to win on the national football league is you got to protect the football and you got to know when to take chances, when not to take chances. And so as much situ, and I'm sure I am absolutely positive that their staff has already addressed this in in a bunch of meetings how can we practice manage our practices in such a way that our young players are getting as much game-like situations as possible without beating them up so that they are ready to go when it when the when the bell rings and i think what you'll see out of the jets is a ton of situational football where they're going to, they may say today, we're just working all second and short, right? And they'll go out and they'll script those down in distances and then let Zach play and then give him the feedback. Okay, that's a good decision. That's not a good decision. This is the reason why it's not a good decision. Okay, and then give him another set, set of it the next week and then another set of it the next week because they've got, they're on the, the clock is ticking. And one of the things that we know, guys, is, that your opposition doesn't send you Christmas cards, right? They are trying to beat your ass any way they can. Yeah, that's my only concern. If he gets hurt, then we are screwed. <laughs> yeah, that that could be a challenge. Jimson Crowder can play there. He's thrown a pass and a touchdown in the NFL. <laughs> he, is, he is the only person on our team to have thrown a pass in the NFL. Yeah, that's... <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what they say. They all got to start somewhere. True. Well, uh, it's been great to have you on again, Jeff. Uh, obviously, we will we will hopefully touch base again before 
but like, well, maybe even early season. Because uh, obviously we love having you on. The insights are always spot on. Uh, and we love the stories, um, which we seem to always get the good ones. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, obviously, hopefully everything goes ahead with the CFL for you and that you do um, perform how you want to. Uh, we will keep an eye on it. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll be supporting you this year because... Uh, Yes, we'll, we'll take you as an honorary member. Um, All right, I appreciate that. You know what, guys? That I think, you know, when you think about the Jets, right? Mm -hmm. And I know this really dates me, but <laughs> the greatest picture of all time in the National Football League, I truly believe this, the greatest picture of all time is, and I got a chance in the Orange Bowl to do it, right? Because it's still the greatest picture of all time. When Joe Willie Namath is walking off, jogging off into the tunnel, and he's got that number one sign and the picture shot from behind, and you can just read the name on his jersey and, and the number one, that's the greatest picture of all time. And that's a Jets picture. Yeah. Hopefully uh, the NFL will do, a, will do a montage. You know, we have the 100 greatest players. Maybe we'll get the 100 greatest fours because we've got a good shot in that one. We've got some good ones. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah anybody got any questions uh before we let jeff go because no doubt he's probably got another three podcasts today <laughs> <laughs> or he's going surfing one of the two i'm not surfing today i'm in i'm in quarantine oh no way oh, yeah no. is that to go back to the coaching the reason you're in quarantine? yeah we got, you have to when i came into the country i just serve i'm serving my 14 day one and then we go into another one which is called a work quarantine where all you get to do is go from your house to your workplace and your workplace back to your house. So it's, I'm going to tell you guys, if I'm, if I'm, I may be standing over in the corner talking to myself in a couple of weeks. <laughs> <laughs> well, just drop us a message and we'll jump back on with you. <laughs> all right, guys. Absolutely. Hey, it's, my, it's been my, it's really been a pleasure, man. It's always good to talk to you guys. You guys do a great job keeping up with the jets and keeping everything you know positive and and uh you know if i'm a jets fan man this is the place i'm tuning in every time we appreciate yeah, that jeff. Cheers, jeff. all right guys take care of yourself great thank you jeff